Tere päevast! Happy to see everybody here on this uh, Sunday and uh, I hope everybody uh, feels uh, quite refreshed. I know how much coffee it takes to stay awake in the security conferences because while all the other people globally manage to do their conferences between 9 and 6, the security conferences for some reasons have also breakfast and night tolls. I know it comes from the Brussels conference tradition which now has moved on. Their conferences nowadays look like stand-up. I don't know whether I want to go there, but I think we need to do something about um, allowing people to sleep a little bit more. Uh, I see... I, I hear you. I hear you. We think next year how to do things, um, maybe in a little bit more relaxed way. Then, we are now going to talk about uh, an organization which is very dear to everybody who believes in multilateralism and, uh, and, for who, uh, and who believes that uh, we need to have uh, certain tools to uh, solve the global problems which we are facing. And, uh, and we have to face that. Uh, uh, indeed, we haven't managed to solve uh, many global problems uh, during the last 70 years, but uh, the new ones keep uh, coming up all the time. And therefore, of course, we need to ask this, this question, is United Na Nations fit for purpose? What might need to change uh, in the face of the new challenges, also considering that the old challenges have not gone away at all? And I may share with you a little, a little feeling which uh, struck me when I was first time in United Nations General Assembly. I was, I was there and, and you know I know European Union uh, quite well and European Union uh, is always said to be uh, cumbersome, big, difficult to understand and, and all that. And then I suddenly felt that, oh my God, European Union is an extremely quick, quick little boat, easy to run, easy to turn compared to what is United Nations. And of course, it is by definition this way. I found Jens Stoltenberg and, and shared this feeling with him, and he was also very happy to only work for NATO, uh, <laughs> understanding that uh, <laughs> this, our, our job in Europe is, is considerably easier than, is, than uh, the Secretary General of the, of the, of the uh, United Nations, particularly if he attempts to reform the organization organization is facing. So we, we wish him all the best and, uh, and everything what has been and will be said uh, here today is absolutely said in constructive supportive way. We all support very much the United Nations. Our panel today is Sven Mixer, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Estonia, Lamberto Zanier, the OSSE High Commission on National Minorities, Espen Bath, Ada, a member of the Parliament and former Minister of Foreign Affairs from Norway, and Nathalie Goulet, a member of the French Senate and, and also freshly back from, uh, from Yemen. So has some really on the field experience uh, right at the, at the um, moment what is going on. Uh, I have felt that um, the main issue which uh, we need to look at when we talk about United Nations today is that um, can we stop doing some things if we face all the hybrid risks, if we, if we face all the, um, all the uh, new cyber topics, if we want to discuss artificial intelligence and, uh, and foresee the problems maybe 30 years ahead of us. Mm. And meanwhile, we have uh, uh, running operations which uh, go on and on for decades. Shouldn't the United Nations be more of a quick objectives set, uh, uh, set also the terms for its activities, concentrate its finances, concentrate also its different facilities, because of course, when, wherever there is peacekeeping, there is also the humanitarian aid. And as European Union, uh, in, the, uh, in the person of Federica Mogherini, is trying to gather all its different facets uh, to put the effort in, uh, in one spot uh, globally, be it in Africa or somewhere else, should the United Nations also uh, attempt something like this? And if it has realized that, uh, let's say, it set itself a five-year aim and objective to deal with a problem, and if this objective has not been achieved, should it honestly have an open debate about discontinuation, change of objectives, finding new ways uh, to try out? Uh, etc. Because after all, uh, it, is, it is quite normal that nowadays we do expect and our uh, voters whose money is spent in the United Nations, they do expect this kind of efficiency and reporting back at least on objectives. Even if, we, we, even if we fail, we still need to demonstrate that we tried and explain and understand ourselves why we exactly failed. So I believe there is room uh, to discuss uh, 
And we can see uh, what our panelists think. I will now join our panelists uh, in the chair, and I will first uh, give floor to Nathalie Goulet. Please, Nathalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Um, some some comments. Just uh, my purpose would be like uh, uh, ask not what UN can do for you, but what you can do for UN, because you 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 talk about efficiency. And uh, the last two weeks, um, I was in Ramallah, Palestine, and then back from Yemen. And talking about failure um, in the Middle East, uh, we have a lot of example of uh, failure. And at the same time, uh, I just would like to, to start by, um, um, by the peacekeepers and the blue helmet. Uh, 37,000 of them died during the last 70 years for our security, so that is also UN. So if we are talking about uh, efficiency on the field, I think that yesterday we were talking about think the unthinkable. And uh, let's think about something like efficiency of United Nations. Um, let's think about efficiency of the Security Council, especially uh, next June, the Federation of Russia we lead the Security Council, and I think that what I heard the last day will bring some concern about it. But um, obviously, we, we need to change the institution, and we try a lot of reform, but we never achieve any of them. And uh, because our institutions are very heavy, and we make them more and more heavy by um, additional uh, tasks. Um, we have UNICEF, we have UNESCO, we have roughly um, five billion for United Nations and something like, I found something like uh, 30 billion for the rest of the institution depending from United Nations, which is a lot of money. And all those institutions have their own life with the people living on them and, and uh, with the money spent without evaluation. And if we try to reform, we, we, we have such a navy uh, task that we will not be able to do anything. And, and it's exactly what we told yesterday about thinking about something new. So we, we have to um, enforce the regional organization because they are closer of the people. I was talking about Palestine, which is a nightmare. And at the same time, United Nations is absolutely unable to prevent United States to move this embassy to Jerusalem. And at the same time, the situation of the Palestinian is worse than 10 years ago. And then we are um, armless witnesses of what happened in Yemen. I just spent 38 hours um, in Marib under the coalition security uh, services. Um, and uh, what I saw was enough. I, I don't want to see, I, I was unable to bear anything more than what I saw. But I think that it's worse in Sanaa, it's worse in Aden, and probably in Odeida uh, will be a nightmare too. So we cannot prevent that. So uh, as, as a member of the parliament, you know, I, I would like to, uh, to support strongly um, the parliamentary diplomacy. I think that it would be probably useful to help a United Nations to be more efficient by using the MP in all kind of services that we have, and um, like a NATO parliamentary assembly, like OSC parliamentary assembly, even um, uh, Council of Europe parliamentary assembly, which is also useful for some tasks. I think that we, we, we have the Black Sea uh, assembly, we have, the, I mean, a, a lot of regional um, um, structure that may be very helpful to coordinate with United Nations. And that probably uh, would be a way uh, to make United Nations more efficient. Because right now, uh, there is no point, and I'm, I'm not very um, hopeful about the future. I think the things will continue like that unless we have a strong will. And as I told you at the beginning, we cannot blame United Nations for what the nations are not doing. I mean, the, the United Nations is that the reflect of the will of the country. If the country want to veto, the Security Council will not act. If the countries want to move, uh, the, the United Nations will move at the same time. 
So um, right now, I'm not really, um, I'm not really uh, very optimistic. Uh, I think that um, we have to support uh, multilateralism, and I think that the new French president is also achieving something. Uh, I don't know if it will make American great again, but for sure, it will be. It will be. Uh, it will uh, make France great again in the international arena. And I think it's it's um, uh, maybe a, a little uh, uh, light in the darkness. Thank you, uh, Lambert. I, I believe you have a lot of experience in. Uh, managing expectations, uh, comparing them to the mandates given and the resources allocated. Uh, maybe you can, uh, you can share your opinion on... Uh, glad, glad to do that. Yes. Um, uh, th my starting point would be a consideration that stems from the very agenda of this, uh, 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 of this conference. And in particular, I would refer to the sessions we had yesterday uh, with uh, uh, Nick Gowan, Carl Bildt on thinking yeah. the unthinkable and challenges ahead and is, uh, uh, our leaders able to deal with this uh, uh, massive uh, agenda, a very complex agenda. My argument is that more than ever, uh, in the face of the kind of challenges that we have ahead of us, we need uh, multilateral solutions. We need to build uh, uh, as much as possible coherent strategies. We need to bring in all actors on board and to, and to engage with everybody. And there's no alternative. Uh, also in trying to preserve uh, uh, and strengthen something that is unfortunately uh, showing big cracks, which is uh, a, a, a rules-based uh, uh, based order. Uh, I think we, re we need to continue more than ever now to invest on, uh, on multilateralism. Um, uh, one comment to point that has been made and looking at the UN, and I, if I look back at my experience as Secretary General of the OSC, I see, I see very much the same kind of challenge. Um, if we look at the EU or, or at NATO, uh, we see uh, basically or tendentially, let's put it this way, uh, groups of like-minded countries that have the same basic objectives, that share the same uh, uh, basic values, and uh, they are moving in the same direction. In some cases, they delegate uh, parts of their sovereignty to the, uh, to the organization. This allows the organization to move ahead faster in a, in a more coherent manner with, obviously, the internal debates that we see. Uh, in the case of the UN, and I saw that in the OSCE, we look at organizations that are either global or, or, or inclusive regionally, and by being so, they bring together countries that, in fact, do have very different uh, uh, political perspectives, political objectives, security uh, considerations or priorities. Uh, so the, the, the method is a different one. Uh, it's really that of trying to bridge the differences and to find uh, those areas where you can try to move ahead in spite of those differences. And now, uh, with the return of geopolitics, this is becoming even more challenging. And what is becoming more challenging is also to try to make the organizations more fit for purpose, so to reform uh, and to make them. In the OSC, and I could give you a couple of, of examples myself, uh, when, when I joined as a Secretary General, I found an organization that was in many ways uh, not really functional, and I felt the need for reform. And, uh, uh, and the reason for that, it had been built over, over the years, bit by bit, uh, and, and various things were reflecting the agenda of various... Actually, there is a joke that says uh, the definition of a camel. What is a camel? It's a horse designed by a committee. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I felt I was riding a camel when I, when, I, when I started that job. And I tried to change it. I, maybe I, I did away with a hamper or, or, or something else. But, uh, but I couldn't change the way he was walking. And so I, I, I had to keep going. But still, with a, gamer, with a camel, you can cross the desert. So I think we, we managed to go, uh, to go a long way. But uh, jokes aside, um, one, of, one of the discussions we had, we had it in the retreats with the Secretary General of the UN also, is how can we move, as everybody uh, expects us to do more on preventing conflict? How can we move from the early warning, of which we have plenty? But uh, by the way, we have plenty of early warning, but it's so difficult to share it, because immediately, if I give an early warning, I have somebody complaining, well, how dare you uh, issue an early warning about me, or that kind of thing. But, uh, but how can we move from early warning to early action? And the stumbling block there is often with the countries. Because I had suggestions myself, and there was always somebody saying, no, we don't want to delegate this to the organization. We want control. We'll discuss. And this is what's slowing down the pace 
of the intervention of uh, uh, of, uh, of organizations. So what are what are the answers? I'll try not to not to be too too long in my analysis. Um, uh, not easy. Strong, uh, strong leadership in the international organizations, of course, and, and so st strengthening as much as we can the, the internal governance and, and uh, uh, engaging with the leaders of, of international organizations is one, one thing. Uh, the second is looking at, uh, if we look at the UN, uh, the burden of this complex agenda uh, has to be somehow also uh, made a bit more manageable. One way of doing that is strengthening the role of regional organizations, assisting the UN in implementing policies, policies that often need to be diversified according to the region. Look at the migration challenge and all the, uh, the, the root causes, which are uh, uh, very numerous and complex, but which are also different for various regions. Uh, so as, as there is work on a compact or whatever, or as the, as the UN engages on uh, the, the sustainable development agenda, which is an agenda to address many of these uh, challenges that we have. Uh, we really, to embed this also, to try, a way, to try to find a way to embed it also in the agenda of regional organizations and have a more serious debate, which is very difficult to do. The other thing is also, and that's something we try to do in the OSC, to reach out to other sets of stakeholders to make a difference. And that's the, the private sector, the, 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 the corporate sector, the civil society, uh, uh, really opening up the, the, the parliamentary dimension. Uh, we, we need to open up and to go beyond uh, the, the strict intergovernmental uh, uh, um, uh, method uh, to, to be able to, to make an impact and also to raise awareness and, and to bring the debate back to the people. This was something which I'm afraid our audience here, who is more used to this kind of uh, concrete action, like you have a Stratcom problem, fine, create a Stratcom East and South, assemble some people, assemble concrete examples, do something. You will be criticized, but you will do concrete steps, building relations with parliament and civil society and, uh, and uh, search to engage with private sector is, is indeed something we need to do. But I believe we then need concrete measurable, again, targets, what we are trying to achieve. And uh, Espen, I know you share my understanding uh, that uh, there should globally not be maybe missions around of United Nations which are older than you and I, maybe soon you and I put together, uh, and where objectives have really not been looked over quite quickly, uh, or perhaps ever during their uh, long-standing and, of course, very honourable uh, honorable work what they are doing. And by this, I don't want by no means to say that these people who are working there are not doing all they can. As you mentioned, uh, the Blue Helmets, yesterday it was the Remembrance Day to, to all Blue Helmets. We have uh, also, Estonia has, uh, has people in Lebanon in Unifil. But if you sit there somewhere on the Golan Heights uh, and, and you think about these things, then you feel for people who maybe give their life for the goal which was defined half a century ago and has not been reanalyzed. Espen, what do you think? Well, thank you, Madam President. It's an honor to be here and um, just picking up on your yes, last So the point. name is Kersti here. Um, which, uh, my, my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> from now on is Kersti. I had to start, you know, protocol. Uh, so Kersti, um, in uh, my last job, I was uh, UN envoy to Cyprus, special advisor on Cyprus. Um, that mission, or the, the UN presence in Cyprus is as old as I am. I am 54. That's not an old age for a human being in my own view, but it's a rather long yes. time for a mission, so that to your point. But I wanted to also pick up on your camel point, because if, if the purpose is to cross the desert, you might actually prefer a camel. If you want to travel through the Estonian forest, you might probably prefer a horse uh, or even a car, but uh, definitely not a camel. So the question uh, which the organizers very aptly said is, is the UN fit for purpose? I would start by questioning which is the purpose. And the stated purpose, number one, beyond any other purpose, uh, which is in the beginning of the preamble to the Charter is to save succeeding generations from the Scorch of War. This was written by people who just came, were actually already in, still in the Second World War. Uh, the work was done in San Francisco before the war was over and ended a little bit after the end of the war. And everybody there had the experience of the first, the Second and the First World War. So, and, and, and just before that it was the Franco-German War and then Prussian War. So every generation had inter large interstate wars. If that is the purpose, the UN has been largely been a success. Not perfect, but interstate wars at that scale has not happened for 73 years. 
Now, we who live today in 2018 cannot be content with just solving that all purpose. So we have to look into whether the purpose has changed or evolved into something broader. And I would like to, again, picking up on what is said in the, in the blurb uh, for this panel, uh, is the UN able to deal with the issues like uh, cyber threats, uh, emerging security threats? Well, the answer is no and yes. Um, has it been? Not really. Uh, does it know? Yes. The, secretary, the current Secretary General is very engaged in this. He held a speech uh, at the University of Geneva a week ago. Uh, and that was not the first time, but that was his latest statement where he addressed exactly those issues. And I know that there's work uh, emerging now on, for instance, how to try to regulate um, what is called uh, lethal autonomous weapon system, so-called laws, uh, how to strengthen the verification regime of the bio, uh, biological weapons convention, which is actually very broadly accepted by 180 countries, mm -hmm. but which has relatively weak uh, verification mm -hmm. measures. Uh, chemical Weapons Convention, which is also very strongly supported, but broken, for instance, in Syria, and not only. Um, so there is work going on to try to address these issues. And I think the, the right starting point for this debate is to say that uh, we could do much better, but we could also do worse. Mm -hmm. There are actually norms out there which are broadly respected. And since, since you mentioned working with the private sector, very interestingly, uh, in the Chemical Weapons Convention, there was quite a lot of engagement with the relevant companies, which is good. Not to the same degree in the Biological Weapons Convention, but this is some of the things they're looking at now. That how you can actually strengthen, not create the rule, but strengthen the adherence to the rule and apply the application of the rules we already have to a new technological reality. Because back to Nick's, Nick Goings' uh, excellent presentation yesterday, things are changing so fast that if we believe it was fast the last two years, it's going to be more faster the next two years. So how do we constantly keep updated to this? It's a struggle for the UN because it's multilateral in nature. That creates solidity, but also slowness. Uh, but, uh, but there's some lights in the tunnel, and I think I would, should focus on those lights rather than on everything that's going wrong. Good. Of course, we must always remember that uh UN has helped to save millions of lives, vaccinated children, uh, yeah. given life-saving humanitarian aid, sometimes even managed also, also lately in Syria to remove people from the path of the battle and, uh, and uh, this way ex ante manage uh, uh, and avoid a, a bigger catastrophe. So indeed, United Nations is, of course, achieving results. Some bodies are also very active in getting private money. In. I, I believe UNICEF is one of the one of the shining lights, uh, lights in that. Estonia has been very active there, and I think UNICEF must be the only body, if you ask Estonians to name one UN body, apart from Security Council, it would be UNICEF, I believe. But what do you think, Sven? And also in the context of uh, what uh, Natalie said, what can you do for United Nations? We are the candidate for the United Nations Security Council. What are we going to do for the United Nations, Sven? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's very uh, easy to get frustrated uh, with, uh, with the efficiency of the United Nations. Uh, but then again, when we imagine the world without the uh, important work that the United Nations and it, all its agencies are doing, I think it's very easy also to conclude that the world would, without the United Nations would be a much more miserable place. Uh, I think it's also uh, it's, it's not really appropriate to compare uh, United Nations uh, with NATO, the European Union. I mean, it's like apples and oranges. You, can, you, you, you should not say that apples are wor not as good as oranges because they are not oranges. Uh, there are organizations like uh, the European Union and NATO uh, that draw their effectiveness and efficiency uh, from a very high standards. There's a very high common de denominator. The UN uh, was created as an organization that would de uh, derive its legitimacy from the inclusiveness, which basically uh, is, is to say that by definition the, the common denominator is, is rather low compared to some of those regional organizations or those organizations that are just uh, created for the very particular narrow purpose. Uh, so I think uh, we should not uh, we, we should manage our expectations when it comes to how effective and how efficient the United Nations 
can be. Also, coming back to what Desmond said, uh, uh, we should uh, bear in mind that the United Nations was, was created at a very particular uh, moment in history. And it was designed in such a way as not to make it too difficult to reform it, at least not in a revolutionary way. Not to which, means, uh, which doesn't mean that we should not try to reform it, but we should also man manage our expectations. And, and I think uh, the reform is, is, is possible and is necessary, but it can only be an evolutionary reform. We are actually uh, working with a group of like uh, a growing group of like-minded countries to achieve that reform. And, and I think that even though, I mean, it, it probably will never be quite as efficient in some ways as, say, the European Union, Union although many people are very frustrated with how efficient the European Union is, uh, we should still push uh, to, to make the, uh, the organization more, more efficient and more effective. And, and this uh, accountability, co coherence, transparency, uh, transparency initiative, I think, is a very important initiative. We should keep pushing on that. Um, we have had some success when it comes to, for example, transparency. I mean, the, the reform of the election process of the Secretary General doesn't seem like too much, I mean, when compared to uh, our aspirations to reform this uh, Security Council and its working methods. But, but still, I think it, it demonstrates that, uh, that reform is, is still possible. And finally, um, uh, I would like to say that, that we should also uh, think of the different functions that the, that the United Nations has, uh, starting from the um, peacekeeping operations and, and delivery of all sorts of humanitarian aid and services, um, to, to the um, provision of a platform for conflict resolution or, or even uh, for imposing resolutions to, 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 to some uh, crises and conflicts, to actually the international uh, norm setter. Mm. And I think that uh, when, when we are asking the question as to whether the UN is fit to, to, to tackle the new challenges, then when it comes to international norms, uh, where, and, and, and the new challenges. Uh, by definition, if something is new or previously unexperienced, uh, there cannot be an existing uh, normative framework to deal with it. And, and, and this is where the United Nations, I think, can be, uh, or, or is necessary and can be, can be very useful. Again, it's important to manage the expectations because when we are dealing, for example, with the international law aspects of the, of the, of the uh, cyber security, uh, then in the European Union context, obviously, we can reach quite, an, quite a high common denominator, which will not be in any foreseeable future possible in the UN framework. But we should actually push in that direction and seek, mm -hmm. seek also uh, a way to, to, to address these challenges, because increasingly security is indivisible, and we need global solutions to, to, to many of those challenges. Sven, an additional question to you. Do you think there should be a threshold of human suffering which will automatically take away the veto right in the Security Council from anybody in, among P5? Well, as I said, uh, the UN was set up uh, so as not to make it too easy to, to reform it. Uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, and actually you cannot take away a veto right. Uh, uh, according to the existing uh, framework of international law, it's, uh, there is no one to, to, to actually authorize the taking away of a veto right. Uh, but there, there is an initiative uh, yes. uh, to, to actually voluntarily refrain from the use of the veto right in case of uh, mass atrocity crimes and crimes against humanity. And, and there are actually examples among the P5 who have uh, declared that they voluntarily, uh, voluntarily refrain from using veto. Those are actually the members who are, well, when you look at the statistics, have not used the veto That's too often anyway. <laughs> but but, but it's, I, I think it's a very important step in a very, very necessary direction. As we know, then in, in international law, declarations of heads of states actually create the new international law. So you cannot mm. say we cannot take away the veto right. If you find that the right point in history when people declare they will, starting from some threshold of suffering, then you would have it actually, but well, should, should, the, the should problem, the P5 agree on that? I think yeah. it's possible. The problem with that uh, is that the the charter 
gives the veto powers a veto over changing the charter. So they yes, will actually right. not vote for losing their own veto. I think uh, even maybe right. Natalie, even maybe France would be skeptical to giving up on its veto. Well, it's but could a, be a country uh, they, that could they, be hesitant. They made the promise. <laughs> but, could, but could, of course, be, be very restrictive on its use, which, is, which it is compared to many other, some of the other veto powers. But, I, but, the, the, but Sven is mentioning an, a, a very good old idea which has been around for some decades which we should pick up on, which is that you could have a kind of political declaration among the veto holders saying we will be much more restrictive in its use, even if we legally maintain it. But yeah, yeah. Naturally wants to yeah I mean, that. the veto is also part of the sovereignty. So at the same time, you, you want more multilateralism, and at the same time, the country wants to keep their sovereignty. But it, it's easy to reduce your expectation when you are in Tallinn in a good company, in a good hotel. But when you're on the field yeah. in Ramallah, or believe me, in Marib, which is the worst thing I've never seen in my life. Uh, I was in Kosovo, and probably I've not your experience, but uh, I saw a lot of things. You want more for the people. It's not for yourself. Exactly. It's for the people. So you know, you cannot reduce their expectation, because if you reduce their expectation, they, they, become, they become totally desperate, they are desperate, and then we are digging our own grave, and they become terrorists, and then they become migrants, and then you have the problem, and then we have the problem of migration and everything, because they are too desperate, and they don't trust any country anymore, and they don't trust international organization. So, okay, we are wise, we are peaceful, we are waiting, but things in, think, uh, in, in thinkable, like yesterday, those people are living the unthinkable things. Mm. They are living in such a bad condition. So, as I told you, Yemen, for example, was also uh, and always the, the bed of terrorism because the country is so poor. What are we doing for water? What are we doing for the children? What are we doing for the women? in this country, nothing. And, and they're big um, um, and strong neighbors, not more, even less. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, reducing our expectation, okay. But pushing the population into this kind of uh, terrorism and, and mistrust, I think it's, it's a big risk for, for ourselves. Lamberto, then on, on the issue of the veto, I would like to bring once again a, a, the, the OSC uh, discussions on this as a, as a, as a, as a model. Um, uh, in the OSC, we have a kind of a veto in the sense that all decisions are taken by consensus, so everybody has a veto power and can block, uh, can block a decision. And this, as uh, uh, the membership became more divided as a result of geopolitics and crisis in Europe, we started having a debate on the consensus on the fact that decision making is, was becoming much more difficult and was lowering uh, the, the effectiveness of the, uh, of the intervention of the organization. And one of the ideas that went around that was rather popular, unfortunately, however, didn't really reach uh, uh, enough support, uh, was uh, uh, attaching some uh, elements of uh, uh, qualification to the, to the consensus or, or to the uh, non-adherence to the consensus. That is, for instance, uh, uh, demonstrating uh, that the, uh, 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 the adherence to the consensus by a certain country would have seriously affected its own security interests. So that you put on the spot the country that exercises the veto in a way by forcing it to demonstrate uh, that uh, uh, it's forced to block that decision because if he didn't do that, he would suffer and, he would, and then he would have to explain why. Uh, but th also that would give the moral uh, responsibility to that, to that country and, and by putting a burden on it to... to uh, and perhaps this kind of qualifications could, could help. Of course, uh, you have, however, to convince everybody to accept that kind of condition, touching that kind of condition to exercise uh, uh, the right of veto. Mm. That's a practical proposal. We'll write mm. it uh, into Secretary Guterres. Mm. Yes. I, um, I, want, I, I completely agree with Natalie here that if, if I was a citizen living in the conditions that people are in Yemen, I would be highly skeptical to the UN and everybody else, basically all, everybody out there, because my life would have gotten much worse over the last years and nobody's there to help and a lot of people are there to make it worse. Tragedy here is that 
if you remember back to the early 90s and the sort of long period of time where we could see the retreat of strategic competition between East and West, which we saw as good news, but the growth of uh, destabilization, weak states, collapsing states, uh, non-state actors, we felt for a while that what we needed to do was to develop the tools. The will was there. You could get agreement quite easily in the Security Council of trying to do something about it. We, we, and we had just to refine the tools. So if you look at West Africa in the 90s, you would find uh, uh, one, super, one great power would have an interest and the others couldn't care less, but they said, go be my guest. You know, if the UK wanted a mandate for Sierra Leone, they got it. If the US wanted to do something in Liberia, nobody opposed it. Yet you now, still didn't manage to avoid Rwandan genocide. But he, yeah, that. well, I mean, there were a lot of failures too, but by all means, but th there was a certain willingness and uh -huh. Rwanda helped forge that willingness. Yeah. Now what we're seeing is that if you look at Syria or Yemen or a number of the other hot conflicts, there's fundamental disagreement be between the very members of the Security Council how this should be solved. It doesn't mean that they are pro-war, but they have fundamentally different, they're seeking fundamentally different outcomes. So you don't get agreement in the Council, uh, not even as, not to say that the 90s were anything close to perfect, but it was better in the sense that it was actually achievable. And we, we really have to think through that we've actually gotten worse at agreeing on even trying to solve some of these very deep conflicts because there's a great power overlay. It could be Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, in Yemen, uh, the same to uh, add Turkey, a couple of others, plus Russia and the US in Syria. And as long as they are seeking these different outcomes, only international diplomacy can deal with it. You will not get an effective mandate to sort out the problem on the ground, unfortunately. Sven. Yes, uh, what I meant by uh, managing expectations was not to, uh, not to uh, say that we should lower expectations. I was just saying that, that when it comes to reforming the organization, we should uh, basically have a realistic view as to what, what, what is practically achievable, otherwise we get uh, uh, overly frustrated. Uh, and, and the other thing is that I, I, I quite agree with Espen in that, that when uh, the UN system is paralyzed because of the irre irreconcilable differences between the P5 members, it's not the fault of the UN. It's very easy to blame UN for something that, that, is, that is actually not, 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 not its fault. So I think, and, and when we, as, as member states, provide, uh, fail to provide means for the UN to, to actually carry out its, uh, its, its mandate, uh, then if we blame UN for that, then we are putting the responsibility where it actually should not, be, should not belong. That's what I, what I, what I, what I mean, meant by, by managing ex expectations. Indeed, I agree. As we agreed in the beginning, nothing is going to be said here to be critical and, de and not constructive about the United Nations. Uh, yes, we know it's organigram, uh, well, it's not easy to put together. Yes, there is room to, uh, to do more, but the Secretary General who was elected on the <coughs> promise of trying to do something about that, I mean, he's working on it and we offer him uh, the full support. Indeed, I do agree that the bottlenecks in decision making are somewhere else than simple efficiency. We totally agree. But uh, what you have been talking, uh, particularly Natalie and Espen, and, and I, I feel that um, after all, there are certain values described in the United Nations Charter. It says, faith in fundamental rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. And all this give and take and, and, and co-trading, I mean, what we see every day seems to be quite far removed from this. And I believe that the big part of the loss of the trust and belief that the uh, United Nations could achieve something is that uh, we don't talk about uh, these values which underline, because uh, if, we, if we talked more about them and measured every decision which we take, and indeed maybe the way you su uh, suggested, we should actually uh, justify our decisions, for example, using or not using the veto. If we have to always take these values and justify against them, I think we would have a much better United Nations. So maybe something quite simple can be achieved simply by reminding, based on what we have created this organization. Mm. What do you think? Could sometimes something really simple change the game to a certain extent? Sven, what do you think? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I'm reminded of this old saying that to, to, well, world security, global security is an enormously complicated and complex thing. 
And uh, the, the saying is that for every uh, complex uh, challenge, there's always a perfectly simple solution. Unfortunately, it's always the wrong solution. So I, I, I uh, trying to be realistic, I think that it's, uh, there are no, no simple solutions to those, 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 those challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, obviously, I mean, we should not, when it comes to those complicated and complex challenges, we should not try to or, or aim at resolving everything at once. So I think we should sort, sort of compartment, uh, compartmentalize and, 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 and approach each and every uh, sort of com component part or constituent parts of mm. those, those challenges separately and see what can be what can be done and a lot actually can can be done and I think this reform agenda uh, of the of the of the secretary general is is actually a very commendable effort to to resolve some of some things in a way that really uh, are doable and 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 can produce and demonstrate results to the stakeholders so as to encourage them to push push forward with this reform effort Actually, then Espen, but I asked Sven this question because he's the Minister of Foreign Affairs who has had in the last year to make that choice, go with, uh, with your uh, best ally or go with principles, and he went with principles, I have to say. Mm. Natalie, then Espen. Uh, one second. The, the, the structure are so heavy, and at the end of the day, we all are so lazy. I will just give you one example. We, we went in an IDP uh, refugees camp. The children were in such a bad shape. My colleague and myself, we decided to go to the souk and buy shoes, whatever was, thousand pairs of shoes, whatever. What. And then uh, the security told us it's not possible because you have to organize the things with the organization on the field. You cannot by yourself go and help but you can give us money. And at the same time, you know that if you give money directly to the organization on the field, you never, they never reach mm. their goal. You know that. So we create ourselves mm. a, lot, a lot of commitments, a lot of structure, and then you lose the goal because those, those children, they need shoes. They don't need shoes in six months' time. They need shoes. It's Ramadan. They need to eat. They need to have sweets. They need to have toys. They need to have shoes. And you know, with uh, 100 euro in in Marib, you can buy 300 pair of shoes. Believe me. And uh, you find the, the shoes in the market. And then, but we we just couldn't do it. So we have to refer to the uh, to the um, organization which is a Turkish one, by the way, in Marib and uh, Emirati. And we will wait September, and maybe we will be able to provide them uh, a pencil and books for schools. But no shoes, uh, uh, the, you know, it, it's, it's uh, very emotional. So you cannot match your emotion with the structure. And at the same time, you are dealing with human being. So you have to be emotional. So it's, 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 it's really a, an equation, and it's bearable because you know that you will stay 38 hours, yeah. and you will find your five-star hotel the day after, because otherwise it's just unbearable. Espen. Yes, I, um, two points. First, on, uh, absolutely agree on Yemen, but let's just rem remember that there are millions and millions of children yeah, of who course. get food and, and shelter and of shoes course, of course. by the UN. For instance, sure, half sure, of the sure. Palestinian population through the UNRWA, all the UNHCR sure. work, and, and, and they do more than ever before. But, it's, but the problem is growing faster. So we're not so, so it's both is true. We're doing more, and the problem is growing even further, further than that. But I wanted to pick up on the principles versus close allies thing. Because remember back 20 years ago, in conferences like these, with the same people but 20 years younger, uh, <laughs> we, had, uh, uh, we had a lot of discussions where many Westerners, some Americans, some Europeans, said these rules are just constraining us. You know, these mandates stuff, why do we need the US mandates? You know, aren't these international laws, shouldn't they be changed? We would like to, we would like to sort out the world because we were at the very top for a few years. And there was a strong Western hubris saying that it would be better if we were not constrained. So fast forward to now, we're very happy that we have these rules because we quite correctly criticize Russia for violating international law. And we have a, a good argument for behavior in the South China Sea because we stick to the rules. 
So uh, I very strongly think that the long-term benefit of uh, sticking to principles uh, su supersedes the short-term temptation to go with what is the current in uh, large cities in the West. I totally agree, and if you think that the majority of United Nations states are small anyway, then for small countries upholding these principles is, exactly. uh, is vital for yeah. our country yeah. as well. So it can indeed happen that you have to make this choice in your heart and go against your best allies because you know that in long term these values and principles Precisely. are much more valuable. And do you know, because we have these principles, I notice that in my discussions with our partners and allies, they accept this as a reasoning. They accept this as a reasoning. So it's kind of creates an additional shield or layer of security for small countries and the majority of United Nations member states are actually small. They accept it to just take some time before they get there. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> but uh, don't be so pessimistic. Oh my God. Uh, to, uh, to what uh, Natalie said, uh, she explained very movingly exactly how you feel yourself uh, and I feel exactly the same way, way in the United Re Nations uh, uh, refugee centers and, uh, and I mean if I see there are networks of uh, child uh, children trafficking which make them work somewhere else and when the children are sick and tired then they are dropped at the UN door because UN organizes their trip to home back and it's it's all very uh, uh, very horrible and it's hard to keep in mind that some children really get help from that but it actually reflects a slightly bigger problem which we I think we are facing more and more uh, a good friend of mine, the Prime Minister of Santa Lucia, uh, was, uh, was here in, on e Estonian e-governance conference and we've talked about it before and, uh, and we, we want to have an initiative which will make it clear to the world that globally because of a climate change which for these small countries is a total externality, they cannot do anything about it. Mm. There needs to be a quick and easy access to something which will help them, them to build the same bridge three times a year. Because right now what we are offering them is all kind of development aid, which according to what you said as well, they have to do a lot of papers for. <laughs> But I mean, he was uh, in last autumn, he was in United Nations General Assembly, but his neighbor uh, from a, a neighbor prime minister from a neighboring island, Dominica, was sitting in his office. And you know why? He was trying to fax around these demands for help because I mean, 90% of his infrastructure was demolished. He didn't have the ways and means to fulfill our paperwork. So even if the UN workers are impatient about the paperwork, they can do it and hope that maybe by Christmas I get an additional right to buy pens and pencils and maybe even shoes. But these countries are losing all means. Yet we demand them to justify for development. Its investment demonstrate what is the NPV of this investment or the net present value. Sorry, they are drowning. They, they need quick help. Uh, they do not have any means anymore to demand that help. And they have now funds accumulating, which are in principle set out there. The carrots are dangling, but they simply cannot get them down from there. Mm. What could we do about these things without creating, of course, again, keeping in mind new bodies, new funds? What could be done about uh, these situations? Espen, yeah, if I, may. Sven. I mean, there, there are, of course, two answers to that. You need, what you're talking about now is climate mitigation, which is how do you deal with an actual existing climate change. And I agree that uh, we should, sp I, we argue back home, I mean, we were arguing for using more of our substantive development aid actually towards exactly that, uh, to help countries who are affected. And I fully agree on more swift and effective procedures. But let's also remember that one of the greatest achievements in the UN system over the last years is the Paris Climate Change Agreement, because the real answer is to stop, war stop global warming or curb global warming. And that is actually a formal commitment by all states Mm -hmm. uh, to, to certain things they need to do in order to reduce the emissions and, and, and at least slow down this, uh, this growth. If we don't do that, uh, we will, there will be no purpose in any debates or anything else because eventually life on the planet will be impossible. And very interestingly, now that uh, President Bush has suggested to Trump. withdraw from it, Trump, uh, uh, Trump. <laughs> Trump sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. you uh, President Trump. Trump has suggested to withdraw from it. The, uh, uh, a lot of American cities and states have come out saying that no way we will stick to the principles, particularly those states with people in them, mm -hmm. uh, seem to be quite engaged in maintaining this. So in a sense, it, paradoxically, the Trump uh, relationship to this has actually triggered even more action. And all this comes back to what was agreed on a, Paris, on a, on a UN and French uh, brokered uh, conference in Paris.
I agree. The in involvement of civil society has been fascinating. And Sven, private sectors. Yes. Sven, and then we will involve the rest of the When it comes to uh, responding, also the immediate response to natural or man-made disasters, then I think that, that it's, it's very important that there is no unnecessary bu bureaucratic drag there, that, that, that really the means are in place to respond as quickly as possible. And, and, and there is obviously, I mean, the, 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 the issue of, of tackling the root causes in, that, in, in, in this case, the climate change. And, but the, there's something in between those two that's uh, um, a, a word that is not very often used in the UN context, but uh, one that we are using increasingly in the EU context, also in NATO, that's resilience, trying to build more resilience into those vulnerable, in, into the, both the structures as well as the societies, the societal, societal structures of those vulnerable countries. And that's not only limited to climate change, uh, it's, it's, it's also when it comes to um, conflicts uh, in, in, yeah. in, the, in the more traditional sense. So, I'm now looking for people. There is a hand there, over there, please. Jump up, grab the microphone and fire. Uh, Anke Schmidt-Feitzmann, Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, I feel there's a bit of an elephant in the room that you've been tiptoeing around and our Norwegian colleague has kind of come close uh, looking at it. <laughs> the UN fit for purpose. I feel this is a very, the whole discussion has been very much Western, like-minded, friendly, democratic state-based. Isn't the big problem that we have 193 states and out of which there aren't that many benign well-intentioned democratic states that really want to solve all the world's problems and th that the reforms are really being made impossible by that essential uh, fundamental condition as well. So what, what can actually the Western states do within the United Nations without reforming it to achieve their good intention purposes? Thank you. Who wants to ask them? Well, um Yes, but for, for, I mean, I think that my first answer to that, the first thing the Western country should do is to stick to our own principles at home. I think the, the, what concerns me more than anything right now is the, uh, is the evaporation of the Western idea in the West. I mean, liberal democracy, liberal trade rules, human rights uh, above the state and so on, which is being undermined in the West. And of course, outside the West as well. But if we cannot do it at home, I think we cannot expect too much of the rest of the world. And my second comment is that the fact that a state is not democratic as we see it does not necessarily mean that we don't have shared interests. This same state can have a strong interest in curbing climate change as well. They can have a strong interest in protecting the principle of sovereign equality of states. Uh, they might not necessarily be democratic, but they don't want war and deterioration of life either. So uh, the UN provides a vehicle where you can agree with people where you agree uh, without having to be in sort of one cozy club of complete agreement on everything. Um, it's, it's far from perfect in principle, but the, if we didn't have one organization that respected the principle of sovereign equality of states, we would have to invent it because we cannot do everything through coalitions of the willing or regional. I'm, I'm all for regional organizations and I completely agree. I want to say that the UN should work much more effectively with regional organizations where relevant. It says in the charter that it shall. The charter, the chapter six and chapter eight is full of reference to regional organizations that can do yeah. things that is otherwise done by the UN. Uh, but there were, no, there were not so many at the time in 45. No, there are many, so use it. But I, I, I think that there is still need to look for those shared interests on the planet. And I think you, we have many actors outside what we refer to as the West who agree on many of these goals, if not all. The, the, the sustainable development goals is universally accepted. It doesn't mean that all live up to them, but it means we now have a global standard of what we mean by development. That's quite an achievement. So any want to well, in some in some ways, I think it's fair to say that uh, that uh, liberal democracy is in retreat in parts of the world, and I, I think it's it's tragic, uh, and I think uh, obviously that should all the 193 member states of the UN be adherents to, to, to liberal democracy and parliamentarism and, and everything, uh, all, all, all the other values uh, that we hold dear, it would be a more efficient and, and more easily manageable organization. Um, but as I said at the very beginning, it's, uh, there is a, 
a certain kind of legitimacy drawn by just the inclusivity. We all we we, we know all, all all very well that that uh, a very big proportion of the world population are uh, represented at the UN uh, uh, General Assembly by by governments uh, they have not had a chance to vote for or against for that matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but uh, that's 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 the imperfect world we live in and we have to actually um, I think uh, use the, the, the tools and the mechanisms that we are, have at, at our disposal to try to, to mitigate some of the challenges and, and resolve the conflicts that we, that, 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 we, uh, that we have. There were times, I think, uh, some 15, 20 years ago, when, when many people in the West still believed that the end of history in the sort of yeah. Fukuyama sense was imminent. And there were governments who tried to speed up that process uh, by by ex exporting democracy to to, to the corners of the world where it, yeah. it had not taken root uh, <laughs> in as a natural by, by natural cause. Sure. Uh, it didn't work out too well, but, but so so I, th I think that we we have to uh, well live with the unfortunate fact that that the world is still an imperfect place. Thank you. There was another exactly. question there, please. Thank you, Josh Gold, NATO Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. My, president is or, uh, my question is mainly aimed at President Kaljulaid and Minister Mikser. Uh, Estonia has had real impact and leadership in the EU and in NATO, particularly in cyber defense and digital innovation. Uh, how, how could a country, a small country like Estonia, uh, ha give this leadership a more international focus? Would an Estonia in the UN Security Council really be able to push truly global solutions, as Minister Mixer mentioned? If I may, that's my job in this country, so running the campaign for United Nations Security Council. Indeed, we are so small country, we have absolutely no time for small objectives like, I don't know, setting some but, uh, agenda points and rearranging them on the Security Council agenda, which was suggested to me by uh, uh, some experts. Uh, no way. We are going there to deal with exactly this, what uh, we were also supposed to discuss today, but we haven't done too much of it hybrid risks, new risks, cyber risks, looking 30 years ahead of what will we do if we have AI, what will we do if we have autonomous, not only automated mm. systems. And we believe it is exactly now, 2021, when we need to settle these discussions ex ante, because when we already have the tools, we realize that then it's much more difficult to get to the agreement. So vote for Estonia and, uh, and indeed we will cover, but Sven wants to, Sven in, wants in, to in agree. In some very practical ways, uh, we, we are very proud to be the, the, the uh, hosts of the of the NATO um, uh, center of excellence on cyber defense and uh, they are they are dealing a lot with the international law aspects of the of the of how you govern cyberspace and how you operate in the cyberspace and it's an institution that is co-owned by all the participating NATO nations it's not an Estonian institution or a NATO institution as such but but we are we are proud to provide the, uh, the but Sven, the let's ac let's accept we carry a lot of weight in Indeed. the digital discussion yeah. globally. Yeah. Unbelievably great weight, Estonia, exactly. And mm -hmm. of course, we give all the, uh, all, the, uh, all the limelight to our center of excellence, and I'm great fan of Tallinn manuals one and two, but the responsibility lies with us to promote this on Indeed. the international mm -hmm. scene. But perhaps more, more relevant to the, to the UN and, and what the UN is doing. Uh, we just earlier this week uh, hosted, uh, the, our e-governance academy hosted uh, and the, the annual conference that was attended by, by uh, representatives of uh, 79 nations, I believe. And, and it was dealing with the provision of digital services via the internet, which is a great way of uh, improving the uh, accountability of the government and transparency of how the governments operate and also provide more spe uh, the, the government provides services more, more, more speedily and, and with less bureauc bureauc bureaucracy and, and sort of also fighting, helping to fight corruption. So it's, uh, it's something really that I think is, is, is uh, um, well, not quite so controversial. Well, obviously not every government wants to, wants to increase the the transparency of the operations, but, but it's not uh, in, in, in sort of some quite so politically controversial perhaps as some aspects of, of cyber defense and, and, and the hard cyber security are. And so there are things oh, that are very relevant also for UN purposes. Uh, when we were holding the EU pr uh, Council Presidency during the second half of last year, uh, we in, in our um, 
uh, development uh, cooperation within the European Union. We, we try to push forward the agenda of digital for development, using the digital means to, to uh, deliver uh, development aid, as well as actually uh, well, mm -hmm. making the uh, digital development in those target countries of uh, EU's development cooperation a, a very high priority. Naturally, and then Lamberto wanted to have a word. Estonia indeed has a memorandum of understanding with African Union on all things digital. So, but naturally, yeah, you, you just, you just, your country, uh, Excellency, just uh, uh, show that where there is a will, there is a way. And uh, it's exactly what we need. I mean, United Nations is one country, one vote. It's not small and big country, of course, but at the same time, your achievement. Uh, regarding the high technology and security, digital security, is an example for other yes. countries. And I just would like, at, at this special um, a moment, um, um, tell you how much we are grateful for your decision to uh, send uh, 50 people, 50 soldiers, uh, in the Barkan, in uh, West Africa operation, because they are, you are the only one in European Union almost to send people or the security of Africa, it's our security. And we were a little bit alone in this story and you just send uh, 50 soldiers. So it's, it's a, it's a, it shows that where there is a will, there is a way. And you are just uh, pointing the right way. So thank you. I wanted to make two points. The first, uh, uh, specifically on the, on the issue of cybersecurity, uh, can, can point to an example of how we are uh, interpreting uh, methods of dealing with security issues in this divided environment, political divided environment. Um, uh, in the OSCE and in the UN, uh, the approach to security is generally a cooperative approach. So you have to work also with people who have a very different vision of what is happening to try to find a, a, the common denominator and the will to, to engage. What we're seeing in the OSC is the, the cooperative security tools are losing traction. Uh, for instance, all the CBMs, CSBMs in the uh, political military area, the, the observation of military exercises are becoming very controversial. Uh, and in the cybersecurity, we have exactly that, uh, 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 that, that uh, dynamic, that negative dynamic. We have developed two sets of cyber CBMs uh, thinking if there is an attack, we create, there is a process. You can ask questions, you can bring countries around the table, you can engage with experts, try to understand who is the responsible, etc. We agreed on those two, but nobody really showed the political will or the interest to activate them when they were. So perhaps we should also reflect on uh, uh, is really this big polarization, the crisis we have, uh, Ukraine, Crimea, is this becoming now a stumbling block to every kind of interaction mm. also in other, in other areas? Or is there a space where we can still continue to operate looking at the new challenges uh, without uh, abandoning, if you want, our basic principles and the, and the fundamental values, etc.? The second point I wanted to make is that there is a space below uh, the level of, uh, how can I say, the constant uh, search for consensus on, uh, on how to move forward. This applies also to the uh, differences in the membership of the UN or of the, of the OSCE, of regional organizations. And an example is my current mandate. I, I've, been, I've been given a mandate which is a, 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 conflict pre a conflict prevention, early warning conflict prevention mandate, focusing on minorities. I was recently in, in uh, Uganda and a meeting with the African Union on these things. And it turned out to be extremely interesting because we were looking at the nature of conflict and we're seeing that there are hardly any classic uh, interstate conflicts around. They're all internal conflicts, uh, or hybrid uh, or with minorities, secessionists, uh, with sometimes uh, proxy uh, groups operating on behalf of external powers, etc. Uh, in this context, making a society more resilient, and you here in Estonia know a lot about that, uh, what are the, the steps uh, focusing also on long-term issues, on issues like education, the use of language, citizenship, participation of minorities, makes the society stronger, more resilient to conflict, and therefore this is a good way of preventing this kind of new conflict. Uh, um, uh, because it, it will be much more difficult to exploit the ethnic differences if you deal with that uh, uh, up front. Uh, 
in, in Europe, we have developed, and in the OC, we have developed a number of guidelines with recommendations that are very much inspired by models like yours here, uh, here in Estonia, uh, with suggestions of where you should proceed and where you should intervene to try to make society stronger. And in the, African U the African Union colleagues were telling us, we have nothing like this. Mm. And actually, this would be really interesting. And they went away with a whole collection of things. And we decided to do something in New York in, in autumn to present them to the broader uh, membership of the UN. So there are models that are in innovative, creative, and effective uh, that can be used that don't really require us to engage every day uh, with everybody to try to achieve consensus on what to do, on what to do next. I'll give floor to Espen, but I would ask everybody to take notice. We just heard OSC representation to say us that we Estonians have bred and grown great societal resilience in the multinational context here in Estonia. What an achievement for us thinking of where we come from 1991 and some statements which this organization then made about our society. Espen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lamberto. <laughs> I also want to commend good work on that on the Estonian side. I, I think what, what Lamberto said here is extremely important. Uh, and the, the lack of tools that, after all, was there back when we had the Cold War. Now, there's an argument going around that we're back in the Cold War. I disagree. This is not the Cold War as we knew it. But it is strategic competition between strong states. And it's different from the 90s and the, and the first decade of this millennium. It is something else. Uh, but in one sense, it's worse. Because after all, when we had the real Cold War, with all its uh, flaws and all the tragedy that came with it, it, there was also a mutual recognition that we shared a problem. There was a risk of inadvertent nuclear war, for instance. And, and CBMs and, uh, and hotlines and FISA material cutoff treaty and a whole range, ABM treaty, a whole range of, uh, of uh, agreements were established to deal with that problem. Now they are either gone or obsolete or, or um, withering away uh, because the structure of the problem is very different. Um, and this is something Secretary General Guterres speaks a lot about and he spoke about in this speech I mentioned in Geneva last week again, but also at the Munich conference for those who were there, that he is worried that we are again in a time we should worry much more about nuclear war, not Armageddon as in the Cold War, but the real use of nuclear war because we don't have these mechanisms in place. So I think that with the return of a more multipolar or strategic competition between strong states, we have to look back on what we after all learned from the times when we lived in this. And, and the OSCE comes out of the CSE, which was developed in precisely to yeah, deal with those issues. And, and the UN, most of its life, has been living under the Cold War. It's just for a few decades that it's been post-Cold War. So there is something there in history that we should not forget now that we're seeing this competition mm -hmm. coming back. Thank you. There was a question somewhere there. Yes, please, go ahead. Hello, Johannes Tim, Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik and University of Tartu. Um, there was an assumption in international relations theory some time ago that in order to achieve cooperation, you need a hegemon who makes it happen, so to speak. Recently, we've seen that the country that has traditionally taken on that role of hegemon to spur cooperation is not taking on that role at the moment. But I think we're also seeing that there are examples of so-called non-hegemonic cooperation. You've already mentioned uh, the Paris Agreement. I would add in a regional context, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where Japan has sort of taken it on to itself to keep the free trade agreement up without the US in it any longer. What could be some other areas in the multilateral realm where Europe could take on additional responsibilities to make multilateral cooperation happen globally? Thank you very much. Very good question. Who wants to start? Minister. Well, I, I think that Europe is um, doing a lot, actually, to, to take this sort of multilateral uh, agenda forward. And um, uh, I don't necessarily share the premise that it takes a sort of hegemon in the, in the, in the, in the global order to, to, to make any cooperation possible. <laughs> I don't think this is necessarily, necessarily the case. Uh, indeed, uh, there was a, a, a brief period uh, uh, the, um, what was sometime, that, that, that was sometimes referred to as the Pax Americana uh, in the immediately after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but, uh, but I think that it was 
it was not necessarily the case that, that the uh, cooperation, uh, um, multilateral cooperation, was sort of um, facilitated by the, the, the sort of uh, pressure from the <laughs> by by the, by that uh, global hegemon. And uh, well, I think it's unfortunate that that the the current U.S. administration seems to prefer bilateral arrangements to, 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 to multilateral formats of cooperation, uh, but that does, uh, does not mean by any means uh, that, that they are trying to step out of this sort of uh, global, global order, outside the global order, even if they withdraw from, from uh, some uh, agreements, the Paris Climate Agreement, or more, more recently, the JCPOA. Um, well, it's, uh, I don't think it's ever, 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 ever going to be uh, easy to manage that multilateral cooperation, and I don't think that the EU should aim at, at uh, taking over the role previously played by the, by, by the, by the US, but we, should, we, we are de doing quite a lot, particularly in our immediate neighborhood and, uh, when it comes to our clo closer neighbors of the, of the Union. Uh, just telling you maybe, Yeah, but maybe we have to print a one euro uh, uh, note instead of one dollar, and maybe we can fight with euro like a dollar is fighting all over the world, because you know, if you see the agreement with Iran and the blackmail done on European companies not to work with Iran now is just unbearable. We had an example of what happened when United States is not playing the European game and let us on the side. So uh, maybe we have to enforce our economy and, and uh, our currency against the dollar, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the points that we have to support mm. to have a, a stronger relationship. It's also the economy. I think uh, we, weaker currency, of course, creates a negative spiral, <laughs> maybe, economically, so I'm not so sure. Luckily, we don't have to go through UN for that. That's no, we <laughs> don't. But it, it's a super important, a super important question, and it's, it's one of the fundamental debates in political science, and we may not solve it tonight or to the, this uh, afternoon. Yes. But, uh, I mean, one alternative approach to hegemonic rule is uh, kind of a concert rule. And so like after the uh, Vienna uh, conference, we had, the Vienna, we had a concert system that kept Europe together, not because there was sort of a shared identity, because there was some common interest among grown states. And very interestingly, why did the UN succeed more than the League of Nations? Well, one thing is that the founding fathers, they were fathers at the time, I have to say. Uh, the founding fathers combined the principle of sovereign equality of all states with saying that some states are more equal than others and hence there are some permanent seats. That was in a sense the 19th century of a concert uh, combining with the 20th century democratic principle of, of equality of, of all states. And in that mix, I think, you know, most of the time the UN has been around, we've had this strategic competition between key states. It still delivered certain things. So in a sense, we're back in a world which is mo more close to what it was designed for than the short time from 1989 to a few years ago that we, we thought was the new tides. Uh, unfortunately, the EU is not on the Council. Um, maybe France would donate its seat now that England leaves. Uh, but, in, but without being on the Council, I think the EU is a center, one of the centers of gravity in, uh, in trying to develop some kind of a concert approach. And I think China, with, with which we disagree on certain things, but also we agree on other things, uh, is another player that has to be reckoned with as quite important in how the world will look in the next 50 years. Yes, but if you say we have come full circle and now it again fits better our world than it did meanwhile, that would mean then that we shouldn't try to discuss uh, how many permanent members, uh, non-permanent members there should be in uh, Security Council. Well, it, we, it, should, we, we should be happy as we have it. We can discuss it if we find it entertaining, yeah, okay. but it's not Thanks. something that is going to change. So, so it, it, I mean, the problem with that is an interesting discussion, but it, it's a specific historic reason why it was set up as it was. And it, 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 the rest of us, I mean, Norway, for instance, or Estonia, or uh, Italy, uh, we feel sovereign even if we don't have a veto. We don't think we need a veto to be sovereign, but we kind of recognize without really liking it that some countries have and we, we don't. If you started to add more countries, uh, you will probably have much more of a fierce debate about who that is, because the, the, there are a, big no, a large number of candidates, but then there are second, you know, n the next country in influence and size. 
will start to argue against that. So I think in reality, to be frank with you, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. And there are all, I, I would start somewhere else in reforming the UN. I agree with you, but you gave me just a great argument, Sven. Yes. Uh, yeah. on, on, on the multilateralism, I think that sometimes in the political discourse, two things get mixed up. Uh, one is the dichotomy of, 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 of uh, multilateral versus bilateral relations, and the other one is the multi multipolar uh, versus unipolar world order. And, and obviously, I mean, we would be, I, I, I think all of us would be pretty happy to live in a unipolar world order dominated by, by liberal democracies. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but because multipolar world order obviously means that some are more equal than the others, as, 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 as Espen, Espen put it. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it's, it's realistic to expect that we will come to that stage or return to that um, sort of uni, uni, unipolar uh, liberal democracy dominated world order anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we have to do with the uh, uh, alternative and, and I think in, in, in this alternative, uh, any, any of those alternative scenarios, uh, the, probably the best, best for us is a sort of uh, multilateral rules-based uh, global, global order. And this I think uh, is, is, is achieved or should be achievable. Lamberta, comment to you. And then a, a short point them. on this, and of course my, my definition of Europe is different from the one that, that was now uh, seen by others. It's, it's broader. But I think what we, what we can export, and I think where Europe is strong, is that we have a model of uh, a very complex uh, institutional structure, multi, multilateral structure, uh, in terms of regional organizations uh, with you know, concentric circles or, or, or uh, parallel circles, but also a broader framework. Uh, that, in fact, is of interest to others, and they start looking into that. Uh, uh, when I was Secretary General, I traveled very often to Asia or to, or to Africa or to, or to the Middle East, and they were, uh, there was interest in exploring and understanding better how things work here. I, one example was our engagement uh, in the context of the crisis in, in and around Ukraine, and especially the operation in, in Donbas, where the UN uh, actually struggled, and, and in fact we were working very well with the, with the UN, and I was in touch with the Secretary General of the UN constantly on that, and looking at who could do what. But in fact, we needed a certain architecture, we needed, we needed also a strong regional ownership, uh, for that operation for us to be able to, to succeed, to engage and to play a role. Uh, and this was observed and not, noted by others. So we can also export a method in a way, mm -hmm. and, a method of uh, projecting stability in our own, uh, doing it uh, in synchrony with the UN and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and not as an alternative uh, to the UN. Very uh, important notion, and I think it's also very much the way the future international multilateralism could intertwine <coughs> different regional organizations with UN. There was a question over there, and maybe another over there, so let's take two, and then we can Thank also. you very much, Rob Hubert, um, University of Calgary. Um, I think our Prime Minister might be trying to compete also for that seat in the Security <laughs> Council. Um, but I'd like to pick up on a point that has been brought up, and that is, of course, the issue on sovereignty. Of course, prior to the events of 9-11, we saw one of the major debates within the UN was the whole issue surrounding the responsibility to, uh, to protect, the responsibility to yes. respond. And I mean, in essence, what it was all about was the issue of our understanding of sovereignty and how we can deal with intervention that goes beyond state sovereignty. Now, of course, we know the events of 9-11 seem to have pushed that off the stage of discussion where state sovereignty became the core element or the coinage that everybody seemed to go back into it. But I'd be very fascinated, given the context of go looking 100 years uh, into the future, at what point can we have this discussion again, particularly when we've heard from, uh, uh, from Natalie in terms of the, the horrible conditions that exist, when do we have this discussion again in terms of whether or not we can talk within the UN context of trying to wrestle with this, this issue of the power of sovereignty, that we can get back to the responsibility to protect and basically get away from some of the issues that are so problematic? Or is that just simply off the table? Or is that just a fleeting moment that won't come back? Yeah, we take another one and, and then it looks like answers to those will also be your final, uh, final comments, I'm afraid. Hi, Sarah Mendelson, Carnegie Mellon University. I was the US ambassador to uh, the UN's Economic and Social Council under the Obama administration and alt rep to the 
General Assembly, Assembly one observation and then a question. Um, the power for reform at the UN really lies with the member states and the, the countries that are represented in this room have enormous power. So when we're asking UN agencies to do something differently, the power lies really with your representatives at the UN to push the UN agencies, including UNDP uh, and the refugee uh, agency. Um, the question is about the sustainable development goals. Um, I'm a big champion. I was part of the team at the, in the US that advanced them. I think this is an agenda that can get us out of a lot of the difficulty that we're in. If you work on poverty, if you work on combating human trafficking, if you work on anything related to security, uh, climate, obviously. I'm very worried that most people in this room, I'm guessing, don't know anything about the SDGs, haven't ever heard about them, or maybe they think about them, but it's largely irrelevant. What is your sense of how we make this agenda known to populations, to citizens, to civil society groups, and make sure that we deliver on this agenda? I think youth are really interested. Um, we're working on an effort called Cohort 2030, uh, but we need more help and more lift. Thanks so much. So, who wants to start? Lambert, you. On the, um, on the SDGs, which is uh, a, a really a topic in which I'm interested and I was investing on that in the OSC and I got exactly the same kind of reaction from the member states. What is this? Why should we, is this on, on our plate? And of course it is. A regional organization of the UN, we should, we should have, and it has to do so much with uh, uh, many things on the agenda of the organization. It does structure and it gives us, this is the key point to me, a long-term agenda. Uh, and this, uh, I think, is where uh, multilateral institutions have an edge, and this is why we need uh, uh, really to find ways to continue supporting their role. Uh, increasingly, as I engage with governments, I see uh, short-term approaching prevail or prevailing over uh, everything and uh, considerations it's always everything is about the upcoming elections mm -hmm. and what is needed and what is uh, what is the policy and what is the p what are the people expecting between now and the next elections the kind of challenges that we face are mainly long-term challenges some some of them hopefully very long term uh, but we need to start engaging now with this long vision, which entails also possibly unpopular policies and policies that would result in, in, in leaders uh, uh, losing support or having to argue more strongly, etc. This is where also a, a, an international institution and multilateralists can uh, cover the back a little bit of politicians and help leaders also come up with, uh, encourage leaders to come up with long -term, uh, the long-term visions that we need to address, uh, uh, to address these issues. Uh, SDGs perhaps is a bit too much of a, of a jargon, uh, so we need perhaps to translate these things into something that is uh, better to easier to communicate to, uh, to the people, but there is a distance between the work of the, the, these international organizations and the people, and this is something I was trying to work on also uh, in the OSC as a Secretary General by introducing initiatives like Security Days that look, look like this, where I was putting delegations and the civil society together to communicate, to communicate the, the agenda. We, uh, I think if we shorten the distance between uh, the work of the organizations and, and the people, perhaps we have a chance to succeed. Thank you. Hespen yes, and Natalie uh, uh, two, ex two excellent questions and on responsibility to protect. <coughs> Um, that was actually two debates that conflated into one. One was what should we do? Uh, and the argument was we have to be more willing to intervene if a state uh, you know, seriously violates human rights. And the other one is who is we? Uh, and the first debate I think was actually largely successful. It is it's in 2005, it's in, it, it, it's in the UN. It came in the UN package in, in 2005. The problem with the 99, 98, uh, 98, 99, 2000 debate just before 9-11 was that it, to a lot of people outside the West, it sounded like an argument that we will ignore the old rules of who decides. So that, that was not always intended. I don't think, for instance, Lloyd Axworthy and his leadership was based on that, but that's what it sounded like because it came with the Kosovo intervention. So we lost some years. And then 9-11 uh, came, and then we started to strengthen the very security and surveillance systems all over the place, which we had previously said you have to reduce. So, uh, but, but it's not gone. It's just that we have to clarify that although we need to broaden uh, what we can do, uh, we also have to be clear that the we is 
settled by the UN Charter, otherwise we will not get broad international consensus. And on the, uh, on the UN reform, at first, as I said, I mean, SDG and, and the Obama administration was very actively engaged, very positively engaged, so thanks for that. Um, finally has given the development community writ large a common goal and a common measurement scale. It actually matters. And there's a lot of companies now signing up to this and say that we want in our practice to mm. respect the uh, SDGs. It doesn't matter that the whole world doesn't know about it. The people who matter actually does, it, it actually has material effect. So it's quite an achievement, it's a soft, uh, soft achievement. And I could not agree more to what you said that it's up to the member states to reform the UN. Um, this is not only on this big picture of Security Council reform, it's also the everyday life. And the first thing we should do is to stop doing micromanagement. We should give strategic guidance. This goes to smaller countries like my own and larger countries like yours, for instance. Uh, less micromanagement, more strategic guidance, but allow the organization to go around with their business. And um, uh, not everybody knows, but the real locus of power in the UN is not where you think it is, but it is something called ACABQ and the Fifth <laughs> Committee, where the money <laughs> stuff is being decided. And there you have people um, from ministries of finance and so on who have a completely different objective than uh, the politicians who just spoke in the other committees, because they just want to save money wherever they find an opportunity. Now, that, that's not a bad purpose, but it's micromanagement rather than strategic leadership. It would be much better if we said, here are the things we want to do, and by implication, you can stop doing these other things. But instead, we do kind of uh, uh, take a little bit from everywhere, and, uh, and then no part of the system is, is uh, aptly funded. Thank you. Nathalie and Sven. Well, um, um, regarding the reform, I, I think that we, we have to, to continue to think about uh, uh, reforming the uh, UN, and including the Security Council. I think that it's a, it's a, a, a sane um, a thing, and uh, that is a good thing, because, you know, security is a, and especially as a permanent member, we had a, a, in France a committee um, led by Robert Badinter, which was a very famous uh, mm -hmm. minister of justice. And uh, I think we, we need to think about the day after. We, we, we need to think about India, we need to think about China, we need to think about a South American country, a new country who, who probably uh, deserve also this uh, status of permanent member coming from the last uh, world. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, maybe uh, just to be provocative at the end, if you allowed me, um, I was working on a very interesting issue, which was uh, the taxes on the international uh, uh, civil servant, and especially United Nations. And I think that the answer to your question, Madam, would be, Madam Ambassador, would be uh, probably to put more and more money into education. And if we need more money to education, I think that it will solve a lot of issues because uh, uh, you just mentioned education once during all this panel. And uh, my vision of uh, United Nations and, and how you can involve the society into the uh, United Nations evolution would be through um, education. And what I was a little scared when you explain us that some tools were still missing in Africa because with all the money spent into the agency for so many years, still we are missing tools. It's quite scary and need another debate, I think, Mrs. Thank President. You. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, we're quickly running yeah. out of time. Sven, a few brief remarks, and yes. then I'll wrap up people have planes leaving. Two, two, two excellent, excellent questions and, and, and three excellent answers to those questions. Uh, first, on the, on the conflict between uh, sort of state sovereignty and, and the responsibility to protect. I think there is a, some sort of intellectual conflict between the two because uh, we are critically interested in, seeing, in, in maintaining maintaining a rules-based global order and, and circumstances that would require us to, to trigger a humanitarian intervention are uh, by definition an exception to the rule. So I think that, that um, um, it's, it, it is a very difficult, very difficult conflict to manage. But we have seen actually the, the evolution of the concept of sovereignty over the, over the years. And, and in a situation where the, where the security becomes more and more uh, indivisible geographically and more, more um, a global thing, uh, where, whereby a conflict or a crisis situation in one corner of the world actually has almost immediate implications for the for the rest of the world. Uh, I, th I think we should 
very serious to think of how the how this uh, concept of sovereignty should evolve. I think the the, the concept of the of the sustainable development goals actually reflects very, very well this uh, uh, indivisibility of, of 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 security in in in, in that. Uh, that we need to, to address uh, the development uh, challenges in distant corners of the world, not as a sort of altruistic, uh, uh, humanist uh, sort of thing, but, 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 but as a necessity uh, for our own security. And, and, and I think this actually requires us to think of how we, how we address these sort of sovereignties in the, in the future. I don't have the crystal ball to look 100 years into the future, but I think it's, it's actually so even, even much more urgent challenge. Thank you, Sven. And a few uh, summarizing remarks. Uh, first of all, I sense that uh, we should really remind ourselves of the two most important things, our values and the suffering of the real people whenever we start talking about the United Nations. Second. Uh, remember the achievements which have brought civil society business community on board, Paris uh, SDGs. Uh, for all means, have swifter procedures, but do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And finally, while you are making space for new challenges, uh, find different uh, actors, different players, what you normally think about to try to help the world to solve those issues, like Estonia can probably do with digital and technology related. The small, uh, small islands can help us to better understand what needs to be done in, uh, in climate mitigation. Use us. We have a lot of brain power in the small countries as well, even if our voice is not so loud normally. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being so patient with us, and thank to our panelists.